Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another edition of New Group Offstage. Uh, tonight's panel is called Filming Remotely, and it concerns the new group's production of Waiting for Godot, which is streaming right now for a limited time at thenewgroup.org. And that production by Samuel Beckett, of course, is starring Ethan Hawke, John Leguizamo, Wallace Shawn, Tariq Trotter, and Drake Bradshaw, and directed by Scott Elliott. And this is the first project that's been released from New Group Offstage. So I want to bring on tonight's uh, creative panel. First up, we have Derek McLean, who's the production designer. Hi, Derek. Hi there. Next is Queen Jean, costume designer. Hey, Hi. Queen. Hello, hello. Good to see you. Next is Jonathan Weinstein, the editor. Hi, Jonathan. Hi, everyone. And finally, Scott Elliott, the Films director. Hey, Scott. Hey, Nance. How you doing? I'm great. So um, this is this has really have been a fascinating journey for me to to watch this production, to have a chance to talk to some of the creative people involved. And I guess I want to throw it to you to start with, Scott. Just how did you figure out how to bring this project together in 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 this time, <laughs> this day and age with COVID and and everything? How how'd you do it? Well, you know, this crack team that's here, among other people, uh, you know, uh, it, you know, it was totally a group effort and it uh, it unfolded in real time. Uh, hard to totally prepare for. You know, we're working with this great company, Mila Media, a film company who uh, helped us figure out just how to do it technically. And uh, yeah, it was a mountain, but it was very distracting during COVID. Uh, and it was a really nice uh it was a really nice thing to sort of have to work on and to sort of lean on in, in the tougher times. Um, and uh, yeah, we just sort of all, I feel like, I feel like everybody was so passionate and brought their A game to it that in a way it was really just about putting the right people together and letting everybody be free, but that's how you make these things anyway. Right. Yeah. And um, yeah. And it was, you know, it was challenging. I mean, I know I said on the last panel that everything, that could go wrong sort of did go wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I'll let everybody else talk about those sorts of things because uh, some of them are, are more expert at talking about it than I am. <laughs> well, but, well, uh, I just want to jump in because the first thing I want to say is you're so right about the casting. And I remember once, this is going to be a name drop, but having a conversation with Mike Nichols, who said 90% of good directing is casting. So you've got that gift right there, Scott. Well, that's and, sweet of you to say, Nancy, but like, yeah, you know, like, and also a lot of these relationships go deep and some of them are new and, and have become deep as a result of this project. I feel like I've, I've met a group of people that I never want to um, not have in my life. It's mm -hmm. really been, uh, it's been incredible. I mean, Derek and I have been working together for, you know, a century or two. <laughs> and I'm looking at <laughs> Jonathan and Queen and I'm thinking like how lucky I was to sort of, you know, have an opportunity to work with these young artists and um, and really, you know, watch them blossom under this crazy, crazy um, thing that we created. Before we go on with getting other people's input, I made a, a grave error in the beginning. I, I forgot to introduce and say that uh, Kramer Morgenthau is not able to be in tonight's panel, but he did send along a video to sort of uh, say something to all of us. So if they can, if you can roll that in the control room, please. Hello to everyone at the new group and 
uh, at this panel on uh, remote productions. I, uh, I'm sorry I was na not able to join you guys tonight, but um, I'm actually have re-entered uh, the world of uh, non-remote production. And, uh, I'm at work today, but uh, um, doing this production of Godot uh, with Scott and the whole group was um, a very uh, kind of special experience for me in the middle of this pandemic. Really gave me um, some hope and a creative outlet, and um, I hope uh, I definitely hope there's not another pandemic, but uh, I do hope that we'll all be able to do something uh, so intimate and special, and um, you know, so unique sometime again in the future. Um, so uh, I hope you guys have a great panel tonight and um, I think there's going to be a lot of interesting stuff talked about. Well, that was cool. He's got yeah, that Kramer's kind our of... D Kramer's our DP. He, he he's, the... The, he's the person. Yeah, he was our DP. Right. And, cinematographer. Uh, you can tell he's working hard. He's got that like cinematographer. Yeah. About <laughs> he's, him. Doing, he's doing a big movie with Will Ferrell. Oh, wow. Oh, that's so really he's cool. Doing a big Christmas movie, but we love him, and he really, really did bring he bring a lot to the project, including Sony, who were kind enough to give us those incredible cameras. And although he's not here, I want to tell people that are watching to please feel free to um, write us questions during this panel, and we might be able to get to some of them. And if you're coming from uh, some exotic locale, tell us where you're coming from, too. Um, I'm going to throw this one out to everybody. Um, the challenge of doing Godot in separate spaces. What was that like for you, for you as a costume designer queen, as an editor, Jonathan, and um, Derek as a production designer? How was that uh, challenging for you? Or was it challenging? <laughs> so challenging. <laughs> I don't know, Queen, do you want to take this first? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, thank you. Uh, definitely, I will say this process was so unique and special. And I will say as a designer of uh, costumes and wardrobe and clothes, um, there was a lot of trust. You know, a lot of the choices and things that we um, had really uh, grown and kind of developed in rehearsal. Uh, so that was really helpful to have that time uh, to really see things. And ultimately, we really, you know, had to uh, trust in you know the phenomenal actors uh, to really be the ones who you know were their one person team right to make sure that things were reset to make sure that things were um, uh, you know right and sit on them well um, throughout the entire uh, film. So that was really exciting. And then also, I would definitely say that there, um, you know, like a lot of choices, uh, I will say, uh, have to be um, very specific. Uh, even more specific than you would even think about, because our lens, right, is 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 really what it is. Right. So the specificity of any choice uh, is amplified. So down to eyewear, down to even a choice of bandana, um, even down to a Mets cap. So these are really things that are so integral, and really I think ultimately really give us information about the characters and really kind of land us um, in where they are in this world. And it is a beautiful world that Derek has <laughs> So I'll pass it back to you. Oh, that's lovely. By the way, someone already asked a question, Queen, wanted you to comment on the, on the costumes, especially the choices of the hats for every character. And you were just mentioning the specificity of character. Can you talk a little bit more about that when it came to the hats? Yes, absolutely. No, absolutely. Uh, I'd love to. Um, so for, I mean, the show, I mean, I guess we could start um, with Vladimir, you know, the... Uh, you know, it, thinking about um, texture, um, obviously, you know, our actor Ethan has such great hair, but really, you know, things that complement uh, and things that really kind of suggest a timeless softness and elegance to it. So, uh, so the selection of the hat really came out of that need for it. Uh, something that could be crushed, something that could still be indestructible, right? That will allow you to withstand endless amount of time. And, um, and then for, uh, even for um, 
uh, for the, the red bowler hat. You know, something that I think was really actually came out of conversations too with Wally, uh, obviously and Scott, that really thinking about, um, you know, that the, 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 the significance of it, right? Um, and we, we see it back now in this, um, in this version, uh, in this adaptation that it's red, you know, that it's vibrant and that it really kind of just allows you to really track it through. Um, and when we really kind of see it being uh, how it actually exists and holds space in each of the frames, in each of everyone's internal space. So that was something that was really um, exciting as well. Yeah. It's such a great reveal for the red hat too. I mean, you yeah. see it for the first time over an hour into the piece, and yeah, it's the most colorful thing, thing we see all evening. Hands <laughs> out, so yeah, it's beautiful. It's very vivid. Well, yeah. Jonathan, since you brought that up, I mean, from an editing standpoint, um, was it extra difficult for you to have these images coming from different places and and working with Scott to try to figure out what stays, what goes, and in what order? I just think editing is it's another crucial part of what makes a film work? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it was a totally wild ride for so many reasons. So I, I, one of the things that I love the most about the process is that um, Scott sort of invited me to, to join the process before we even began shooting, um, which was really key to, to the approach of this whole thing because I mean, so the play is obviously breaking, broken into two acts and, and for each act we wanted to sort of preserve the sense of, of continuity and, and seamlessness, even though uh, we obviously couldn't shoot the full hour 40 or hour 20 of each act in, in a row. We had to kind of break it down into blocks. And um, Scott and Monet, the associate director, did an incredible job in prepping um, the whole project they basically broke down the script into i want to say 20 or so blocks maybe even more wow and figuring out um already within how they broke down those blocks how that would sort of mesh together in terms of hiding cuts and finding different ways of sort of um using uh the screens coming on and off and these uh glitch effects that we developed as sort of a stylistic element to to hide those cuts a little bit. And, and I was happy to come in and consult on that and for us to figure out those transitions together and be there for the shoot itself, which was such a crazy experience and so different than, than regular filmmaking um, in so many ways. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was all, it was all truly. And another thing that was very challenging is you know, usually the last feature film I cut, so what's so interesting about um, cutting sort of an original film is that you can really rewrite the whole story. You can change the order of oh, the scene right. and the structure of the film and you suddenly take out scenes, maybe add in new scenes and reshoots, or you're sort of really rewriting the piece. And obviously with Beckett, <laughs> we would never want to do that or and neither can we do that not allowed to do that right oh so exactly so we had to on one hand stay very true to the script and um you know there was even one time i tried to take out like half a line because it worked better for the cut and they they spotted it immediately and <sighs> said no you can't do that <laughs> so we really had to be loyal to the to this incredible text and that made the, the play focus a lot more on just, uh, you know, when are we using the split screens? When are we cutting suddenly to full screens and, and alternating between those? Um, or where can we sort of expand or, or, or limit the pauses or beats in between? So that that became really the focus and those whole, you know, cuts and visual glitches and transitions. So it was f really figuring that out and also just we're so not used to the split screen um, layout as mm. any part of narrative storytelling, really. So that was a very interesting thing to, to play around with and using this Zoom uh, set up to our advantage. So a lot, a lot of fun things to explore, for sure. Those and glitches and those cuts and those fizzles and whatnot, which I just thought were, were I, I didn't know whether they were something that happened accidentally, and then you guys go went, wait, we can use that. But I loved how they were used. I thought they were just great to look at. Thank you. Yeah, no, none of them are accidental. They're all uh, like, uh, they're all adjusted to to the smallest degree. Yeah. <laughs> so it was fun playing around with that for sure. Oh, cool. 
And Derek, as a production designer for you to have people in, in separate areas <laughs> with separate homes and separate accessibility to things, how in the heck were you able to coordinate that and have your vision as a production designer met by all of these different people in different circumstances and different rooms? Yeah, well, the, you know, the challenge was, so the, I guess the look that, uh, that uh, you know, I, I wanted to, to give this was, first of all, to unify the fact that we were, we were shooting this in, in well, really in five different, um, five completely different uh, places. They were, you know, it was London, uh, New Jersey, Brooklyn, and Manhattan for the four principals. And then uh, uh, the boy was in Chicago and, and actually in Skokie, Skokie, Illinois. So, um, mm. so five different places. How do we make that look unified? First of all, that's, that's number one. Uh, and so that, that was coming up with, with, with something, a, a look that made, made it, we wanted to be deliberately ambiguous about uh, are they in separate spaces or are they potentially just across you know, just as I'm reaching towards you right now, Nancy, like, are you just sort of, you know, are we in the same room? Um, and, and so we, that was an ambiguity that we, we wanted, we wanted to, to preserve. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and then the other thing is, as Queen was saying, you know, this kind of timeless quality, um, you know, to, to try to um, be ambiguous about when this is. I mean, yes, it seemed like now to an extent because there was a sort of, you know, zoom quality to the text and we're on, we're obviously the actors are playing it to cameras, but, uh, but there's also, you know, a sense to the look of it that maybe all of these characters have been in these rooms for years. Maybe they've been in there for 20 years. We, we don't know. Like we, we, we don't know how long this sort of ritual of them having these conversations every day has been, has been going on. Scott likened this play to, you know, to, to a marriage or two marriages and, you know, that their relationships sort of seem like people who are sort of bickering in a marriage. And, and so how do we, you know, how do we do that so that, um, so that we, all the ambiguities that are in the play can remain ambiguous to, 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 to the viewer. Um, and uh, so, you know, oddly the biggest challenge, uh, um, was uh, was one of the actors who lived closest to me because we couldn't go into his apartment. We had, we had to deliver everything to his apartment so that he could set it up himself. Some of the other, you know, like uh, John Leguizamo was in London in a hotel room and the, we were, it's a ham yard hotel. We were actually able to get a second hotel, hotel room for the ham, ham yard. And so we were able to actually um, go in there and, oh, cool. and, and set, you know, crew could go in there and set his setup. So that was, you know that was that was awesome, um, but the um, the you know one of the actors we had to a actually make it so he could set the entire set up in his apartment himself, and that was an enormous that was an enormous challenge for him as well mm -hmm. as for us. Mm -hmm. Did you ever consider uh, using a green screen so that the background would be the same for everybody? I mean, it almost seems like cheating because I love what you came up with, but I'm just wondering if that was an option ever. We looked at that. Uh, and, uh, it, it was, um, it just didn't look right. You know, we, we, Scott and I did some experiments with that early on with, and with Kramer, the, 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 the DP, um, mm -hmm. and it just didn't, uh, you, you could kind of tell it was green screen. It just didn't, it didn't have the sort of earthy, authentic feel that, um, that we wanted. Of course. Of course. No, I agree. Um, Scott, do you, do you think that what you created was uh, a film or a filmed play? And, and, and what's the difference? Or is it a, a completely new, different thing? Well, I mean, it really wasn't a film play because that would be on a stage. Do you know what I mean? We would have mm -hmm. had a play on a stage and we would have filmed it. Um, I mean, did we film a play? Yes. <laughs> but, but it's a film. I mean, it, it was you know, it was filmed like, you know, it was, you know, cinematic approaches, even though we were very limited, uh, you know, in the way, but we embraced our limitations. And, you know, um, you could say it's a hybrid in a way. Some people call it a hybrid, which is a funny word for uh, this sort of thing. But I guess, you know, this sort of mixed media thing. But yeah, like it, to me, it's not theater. You know, it's a, it is a play, but we filmed it. So it's a film. 
and we we didn't film it like a play in any way. We weren't on a stage. We were in together, and so we made a we made a film like the only way that you could possibly do waiting for Godot in January 2021. But right? as separate as it was, and with all of the, the you know with COVID and all of that going on, there it really is something very intimate about this production. Scott, that made it feel like, on my end anyway, like I was watching a play. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it was not like watching a film. It was a different, I don't know. I don't know if you're hearing that reaction from other well, people. Well, I mean, different. I think that there is a lot of that because it is a play. We know it as a play. We, right. we, we you know, the actors said the play. Um, uh, and you're right. We didn't have music or underscoring or anything like that. So it had that sort of intimate feel. Um, and... Yeah, I mean, I get it. I mean, I understand why you felt that way. I guess I, I embraced the notion of it being a film because that was the only way that I could personally define it to work on it. Um, I couldn't even think of it as theater because, you know, I'm a theater director. And so, mm -hmm. like, it didn't feel like theater in any way. <laughs> it felt like we were making a film. I mean, right. I directed the whole damn thing sitting where you see me right now. You know, it was like, you know, with a with a mission control room on my kitchen table. But it was... It was. Oh man. It, it, yeah, it was a very emotional thing, and I guess that, like, in a way, sort of what we were after was to sort of do something different, to like create art in the moment of COVID. Like, and what are we leaving behind from that moment? And I think that it was. It, it's sort of not. It's not describable, I guess, in a way. Mm -hmm. um, but the, I defined it for myself to get through it. And also because I knew the technicalities, I had a DP, I had a production designer, a costume designer, an editor, you know, I didn't have a stage manager and, uh, okay. you know, it was yes. like a whole other sort right. of team and crew of people who were using right, right. their brains, their cinematic brains. They were not using their theater brains. And so that was how we, I think sort of felt our group, but, you know, Nancy, all of these projects that we're doing on off stage are, are here for, you know, experimental purposes, right? You know, because I feel, you know, like one of the things that I felt toward the beginning of COVID was, well, this is a perfect time to experiment, you know, and why shouldn't the new group experiment and grow and learn and try different things and, you know, engage artists that we, you know, that we work with to express and figure out, you know, figure out what this sort of innovation is. It, it, it felt really, it, it felt so innovative to be working on it. I, it just had that feeling of something so new. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that was long-winded, but that's, no, that how, was great. that's how I felt. That takes me right into the next thing. I was going to ask Queen about the costumes, because you did say a couple of things, Scott, that really resonated new and real and of the moment. And in other productions of Godot, you know, you see characters dressed more like Chaplin-esque, like very simple, almost like clowns or, or every man. And, you had people in just like regular streetwear. It had a hipness to it. How'd you come up with that? And so, what did that mean to you to make that choice? Absolutely. I think um, right away, I think we uh, as a team really decided that uh, this was our version of Waiting for Godot and that it really wasn't looking back or trying to really re uh, replicate or reproduce um, existing um, uh productions or the quality of them. And to me, a lot of that was about intimacy. And uh, I'll say for myself personally, I had spent like the last year, um, you know, kind of really uh, engaged in mutual aid, really engaged with the folks who, um, you know, have had to live actually in, in a set of clothing for the last uh, six months to a year. And so what does that mean? And so to me, again, that speaks to the intimacy and the specificity. What you're wearing has to not only be functional, but also has to serve uh, its purpose. Um, that obviously, you know, that it gets cold at nights so that all the characters are able to layer up. Mm -hmm. um, and that it kind of really allowed them, again, and then those were the choices that we got to make uh, in terms of color, texture, even down to a sweatpant, um, even down to, um, you know, with with like the stylings um, of things kind of coming on and off, right, about even like with, um, you know, Vlad's jacket, you know, that it feels like, where did this even come from, right? But that it's a found item that has, has its own history really behind it, um, but that now serves um, our character that, that 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 serves this moment. So to me, uh, those were the things that really felt uh, real. Uh, even down to footwear, you know, mm. none of the characters have a closet, right? Everything that they have is something that they have 
ha have had to acquire. And so your closet, your body, that is where it lives. And so the choices really wanted to be that they all lived on them and that it felt right. Um, and well, that they did. Them, you know, and that a lot of the stylings ultimately um, came down to versatility as well. You know, that, you know, things come off when it's hot. I mean, literally, you know, folks come down even to their undershirt, right. uh, even down to bare chest. Right. Uh, then it gets cold again. And so you want to put that shirt back on. You're going to put your jacket back on. So these are the things that really wanted to, um, ultimately to me, I think really uh, spoke to the humanity um, within the text. Um, and to me, I will also echo and really say that to me, that this is a film. Um, this really isn't a, a, yes, this is a play and it's conceit, but the way that it was approached, uh, it was way beyond the confines of a Zoom production. And I really think that everyone did tremendous work. Uh, and the actors, I mean, literally, I felt like for the first time, you know, knowing this play for the last, you know, 20 years, um, we got to hear the text. And it was so intimate. Mm -hmm. These conversations between these men are riveting. They're they're joyful. There's banter. Um, it there's heartbreak, right? I mean, being beaten, but still being able to know that you can come home and you know come back to something that you know is familiar. Which mm -hmm. was Thank you. Did the actors' personal styles um, influence any of the choices that you made, costume wise? Oh, uh, it looked like it. It did. Oh, yeah. I mean, again, I mean, uh, and honestly, like, you know, Scott was really integral in that, you know, that, like, you know, we want folks, you know, to, 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 to be themselves, right? That we want folks to, again, that like, we're not putting on, uh, you know, like a, uh, like a pioneer aesthetic or, you know, like, like, like a different lens or layer right. to John or Ethan, right? That these are who they are, you know, and, and, and that this is the, themselves. So even down to even like the uh, like the positioning of hats is something that you know we really wanted to um, just feel accurate, um, and again that it feels familiar. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it works. It's funny. I had an acting teacher once that said you have to choose the shoes of your character first. If the shoes are wrong, <laughs> he said the character is going to be wrong. So yeah. yeah, he was a weird acting teacher. But in that <laughs> point, I thought that really made sense. Yeah, and, I mean, especially, I mean, with footwear, again, I mean, if you have to live in one shoe for the rest, you know, you know, you want to make sure that the shoe's right. <laughs> for all of eternity, that's right. Yeah. Jonathan, one of the things visually that just blew my mind was seeing the actors passing things from one side to the other. Um, all right, so we don't have the cinematographer here, but on your end, how challenging was that to edit? Um, well, for... First of all, I think the greatest challenge in that was if filming it in the sense of, you know, and, and what was amazing about this project overall is as opposed to uh, your average film where, you know, actors might not have rehearsals at all or like rehearse for a few days. These guys have been working on it for, for months and figuring everything out from their characters to those bits. So when I was on the shoot and saw them, I mean, a lot of the times they just did it the first or second time the take and it just worked because they had already sort of tried it out. Okay. But um, there were, I mean, as with always, and we're filming it, you know, via Zoom as sort of our, our main communication method, even though the cameras are external cameras, but it's, it's really tough to get those things to feel accurate and right. And, and one of the challenges editing it was that I couldn't, sort of their their sync in between the cameras has to have a certain lock to it throughout because they're interacting with one another and i can't lose sort of the the sync of the overall piece oh and here you see some tests of these right things going on. Um, and you know and, and they've already got the you know, camera side of the camera so they've they came to the shoot knowing which way to sort of try that out right and, and in the edit it was just a matter of sometimes tweaking those timings to get it right so they're almost you know sometimes there are indiscernible little things like glitches interfering to then like tweak the timing for a certain bit of it and then revert back to the original timing mm -hmm. um, or there might be these little invisible cuts or slight fast motion slow motions to sort of oh my realize those that you can hardly tell but um but but it all starts from them doing a great job to get it right from the get-go. So that was really helpful. Um, and it's it's funny, you, 
I mean, even during the shoot, we were, you know, we're not with them in the room. So we're sort of seeing it the way the viewer sees it and it just feels real and you, you know, it's not, but it just works somehow. It's such a basic, you know, it starts from the turn of the century filmmaking of Melier in France or whatever, all those tricks and they still work to this day. And it's, it's beautiful to see that come together. It's so true. It, those moments were magical. That's another, like, it, it was another sort of visceral thing that even though there was a screen separating me from what was going on, it felt three-dimensional. It felt, it felt like being an audience member, back to what I was saying, Scott. Um, Derek, I have a question for you. Um, this is a question that someone else actually sent in. It's not my question. It's a great yeah. question. Given that the play's original stage directions say, a country road, a tree, evening, did you get any pushback from the Beckett Foundation because your set was not going to be that way? You had Zoom boxes and, you know, the, the, the visuals were more, were busier than that simple set that they, that's written by Samuel Beckett? Well, no, they knew, they knew that we were doing it this way. Uh, and, that, you know, that was, that was, they, they understood that this was, uh, an, a, you know, obviously an extraordinary circumstance and we were making it, uh, if, you know, they knew that we were filming it in people's apartments and homes. And uh, and so, you know, cr creating a country road or an actual tree or, you know, an at the outdoors was just not a possibility. For right. Us. So really what we had to do was embrace uh, the situation that we had. You know, s some of the actors are in very small spaces. You know, they, they needed to do they needed to set up where they could leave the equipment up for four days, uh, you know, undisturbed and and. Uh, you know, and so <laughs> there's that's the space for uh, where we shot uh, the boy in uh, right. in Illinois, um, and that's what the room looked like before we put our set in. Um, <laughs> oh my goodness! That's their playroom, but um, the uh, so we really had to embrace the smallness of the place, and so the reference to the to the outdoors and to the evening and the nighttime was that each character had a window. And you can see that in this ske sketch. That's a sketch mm -hmm. for Ethan's, Ethan's space. And it, you know, each each space had a, had a window, and the windows were all controlled. Uh, uh, the lighting in the windows were all controlled remotely by by Kramer, our DP. So he was able to, um, you know, put everybody in the same time of day, so that when the sun sets at the end of the act, you know, that, that happened in all of the windows uh, simultaneously. And that was sort of our nod to nature and the view of the tree whenever they go to look at the tree is out the window. Um, and that's really, that's really how we approach those problems. It's fascinating because that, that is a link to the actual country road and the setting. So, so it still stayed within that realm. Um, yeah. Someone mentioned earlier, and um, we have a follow-up question, exactly how long was the rehearsal process? And then how did Zoom impact the work of the actors during that process? Scott, how long was this, has this rehearsal going, been going on? Well, it was an on again, off again process from like last summer. You know, we started, you know, working, uh, well, first it was me and Ethan, then me and Ethan and John, then we added Wally and Tariq and Drake. And so it was just a process like that. And, you know, we sort of went, we decided to just sort of like play around and and discover it in, you know, in, in the Zoom world, because it felt, the first time we read it, it felt right. And so we just kept reading it and working on it. Um, and then, you know, then we would have to take a month off because somebody had a job. Uh, but I think everybody kept working, like everybody kept thinking about it and working about it. And we were all texting and in communication. And I think that everybody was very committed to sort of, um, you know, figuring out the emotional life of the world that we were in. And so, um, yeah, so, and then we worked on it. And then toward the end, we worked on it a lot more the last couple of weeks when we were really prepping, we got to work on it. Oh, there they are. And some rehearsals. Oh, this is the rehearsal. Yeah. Yeah. This is the rehearsals, which were, um, you know, in retrospect, it was quite, quite interesting. And, uh, and it was really wonderful because you can't, it, it, it proved that you actually can develop relationships uh on, on on zoom it's strange and you know i've been having those feelings not as a, just a sidetrack like as i'm sort of getting out and seeing people that i haven't seen in a year and a half but have seen every week on zoom it doesn't feel i don't feel the gap as much it's strange as much as i thought i would 
But uh, yeah. so anyway, we were sort of like figuring out like, you know, how, how the intimacy of, you know, of this world and how this work can be, could be communicated that way. And it was a, it was a really, it was a wonderful experience, but it did have gaps of not working together and then gaps of working together a lot. And, so, and I, and in a way, I think the care, you know, the work washed over us because of that, for that long period of time. And mm -hmm. um, it was interesting taking a break, like not seeing each other for a month and then seeing each other a lot for two weeks and then not seeing each other for two weeks. It sort of had that feeling. Um, yeah, yeah, it's kind of like in the play where you don't know how, how long has passed in between one day and another and it's the same thing again. And yeah, it did have that different. feeling. <laughs> yeah, it did have that feeling. I was, you're right, and, and, and it, it definitely, um, it became what it was as a result of those right. meetings. Um, it wasn't like I thought, oh, I'm going to do this and then had a goal. You know, we I went into it very open, you know, which is a very strange thing for a director. But I went into it and sort of let the uh, let the experience wash over me and tried to guide it from a really organic and authentic place. Um, yeah. And everybody was so willing. So it wasn't hard. It was really, it was actually really fun. Well, well, a bunch of us have long-term relationships. So that was really nice to be with everybody over the, um, over the pandemic that way. Of course. It was, create. you know, I, can I just jump in? This yes, is yeah. of course. It, I meant to know, tell it, everybody jump in, but it, go ahead. It was, it was, it was satisfying and a fun and fun in a way that I hadn't really imagined because it had been so long since we had made anything, you know? Um, I mean, we're all of us here, you included Nancy, we're all built to make things, right? We're, we're built to make, you know, this is what we do. We make mm -hmm. stories we, and we all, we all have different, you know, we, we all have different crafts within that, but that's what we do is we make stories together and, and we tell them for people and to be shut out of that process for so long is really difficult. And so um, to get together communally and work on this, even though we were all on our computers while we were doing it, it was, I found it a very joyous uh, experience to actually finally roll up our sleeves and make something again. No, I could see that. And and again, I guess what I'm marveling at is that even in this time of Zoom and the separation and we're not in the same room, there was, with this production, I felt a connection, a deep connection between the characters and between the kind of work you guys did. But speaking of those walls between people, I got to ask you, Queenie, um, how did you measure the actors? How'd you figure all that stuff out? <laughs> oh, well, you know, I mean, you know, because you know, we lie, you know, that we don't tell the truth ever. <laughs> What's your size? Oh, I'm a 12. No, you're not. <laughs> well, yeah, I, mean, I will definitely say so. Uh, uh, well, well, two things. Like the first thing is, um, I think to me, like the power and the beauty of this was the understanding of isolation. I think for so uh, many of us, right, um, we have like months uh, of isolation. And ultimately there becomes a moment where there's like beauty in isolation, when you've had time to actually sit with yourself and your quiet thoughts and really kind of have to say, well, who am I? What am I doing in this moment? What am I gonna do if I can't come out of this moment? Um, and what I, you know, is waiting for Godot really gonna be the thing, right? Waiting for things to come back, waiting for the world to kind of go back to what it is. Right. Is that what we've actually been, um, it, it, is that the pursuit? Um, is, is that our intention? And so I think for me, the, the, the idea of isolation and kind of seeing breakthroughs kind of emerge from that, I think is something that we actually really see here in the film, which I think is powerful. Uh, and of course the performances are stellar, um, but again, it kind of, again, ties to the text. Um, Beckett's, you know, really uh, timeless um, call on humanity. Um, about time, isolation, relationships, intimacy, um, and ultimately how all of that kind of intersects. So that is something that I just wanted to respond to. And then I will say in terms of that, I mean, honestly, um, you know, whenever folks tell you things, oh yeah, I'm a size two, okay, I'm just a size two. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just, you know, so, so and, and again, like, like it's nothing uh, bad, because I think that's so, and, you know, it's fine. But I think, um, you know, it's something that I just like have over time, you know, just kind of, you know, like you can look at someone and kind of get a, you know, at, like information about their build. Mm. Um, and then you kind of fill in the rest. Um, but yeah, so that was something that I think was, um, Easy. Uh, and also, to you know, obviously our actors were, you know, um, really great. And so, um, 
you know, those numbers weren't too off. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know? okay. But yeah. I guess it was a different, yeah. They yeah. must, they have to be accurate because obviously they're using their clothes. So they would sort of, would they hold up stuff? Would you ask them, what do you have that's like this, that's like that? And did yeah, you get the yeah, preview? Yeah. yeah, I mean, we definitely had a lot of like curated conversations um, about the characters, about their wardrobe. And then even, I mean, and obviously, you know, no one, uh, like a lot of the pieces, especially for this film, uh, folks would not really readily have in your own wardrobe, right? Your own personal wardrobe. So a lot of that, you know, we had to fill in. We had to really, again, like to design it so that it all, all of it really fit in the world um, and that it didn't, you know, feel strange, foreign. Um, or right. or distracting. So a lot of that was, you know, I mean, honestly, even Tariq, Tariq was literally distressing uh, their own t-shirt, uh, you know, things like that. So that, again, is really uh, the magic, uh, I think, of this film uh, and everyone's commitment to really telling the story, which I think to me is, um, is powerful and ultimately was necessary. We, you know, I think a lot of us needed to, to be able to tell a story and to tell this one was, uh, was, uh, I just have to ask, uh, following up to all of that, about the boy. Um, that act, its name is Marshall. Is that right? Uh, Drake. Drake. Oh, Drake. I'm so. Why do I think Marshall? Anyway, um, um, how much input did Drake have with what he wanted to wear? Did he give you ideas, Queen, or were you? I, I'm curious because he's a pretty sharp kid. Yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Child, I should say, not kid. <laughs> young person. Yeah, young person, yes. Um, young performer. Uh, definitely. I mean, I think, I mean, I had a lot of, you know, just like ideas. Uh, and so we had a conversation and shared. And obviously, Drake's parents were super amazing as well. Uh, but, you know, but Drake was like, mm -mm, I'm not really feeling that one. Okay, great. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> and so a lot of those places um, ended up. Um, you know, kind of naturally, um, and even and ultimately, even down to like haircut, right? You know, mm. um, in this world, folks may not be getting haircuts, but that is something that you know, obviously, we wanted to um, to honor, but also we want to still be able to see everyone's faces. So of you know, like, again, so like little choices like that, which are very helpful and actually really tell uh, mm -hmm. the breadth of where we are, or you know, when we meet uh, the characters. Wow, that's so fascinating. Just the look of it was so, so cool, for lack of a better or a more descriptive word. It was really cool looking stuff. Yeah. Um, Jonathan, from your perspective, I'm wondering, having done this project and, and edited and, and put the kind of input in that you did and it just being as, so different from other projects that you've done, how do you feel this experience is going to influence you down the road with other projects? Wow, that's a that's a great question, and definitely one that I'm still asking myself and um, you know processing. I feel like it's only been it sometimes feels like this whole process was a bit of a you know like a fever dream because it was all happening so fast. Once we started, we got the ball rolling, and I think I was telling Scott this the other day as well as um, you know my the last feature i worked on we had about nine months to explore and piece together this two hour long film and here we did a three hour long film and basically edited for a net of about six weeks maybe a little bit more um man so, so it was all super sort of hectic and a lot of you know thinking off of our feet and obviously so much prep work has been done and so much of the sort of the the plan was there to really like hold us up and, and support us and allow us to, I think what really helped here was we came in with a really good idea of what it would look like, which actually allowed us to, um, and Scott was super open and flexible about this as a director too, which is not always the case working on edits. It's just to try different things and suddenly, because we had a certain idea in mind, we were happy and fast to say, hey, maybe we should try something completely different here and you know well, even if it was figuring out those which sections or the full screen sections where it suddenly changes our whole perspective of, of how we're looking at the characters and how they interact and what is going on and figuring out the pacing so uh, i don't know i mean i guess more than anything it's 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 definitely a, a project that's a lot more experimental than anything i've done since i was a film student um and um I think it just gives more freedom to, to play with anything you approach and not to be sort of, you know, 
even though they're blocked into squares here, I think this the, the, the restrictions opened up a lot of sort of experimentation and exploration. And it's definitely something that I'm going to take with me to next projects is not, you know, not to hesitate to think outside the box and, mm. and just, yeah, nothing is too crazy. Uh, and you can always try it. And what's so beautiful about editing as well as opposed to, you know, shooting is when, when you're filming something, you, it's every second is so expensive and you have no time and everyone's together to make this thing work and you can't really afford to make as many mistakes. I think one of the greatest joys about editing is you can afford to make mistakes at the end of the day because you can always, you know, command Z and go back to the other version you had saved before right, and right. make another version and another version and keep on trying till you find something new and exciting and and um, yeah, definitely made me want to keep doing that. And mm -hmm. Derek said, thank you, Jonathan. Since you said that was a good question, I'm going to throw that to Derek too and then to Queen after that. I mean, how would you, pref how are you going to approach new projects? Did you gain things, gain any, um, I don't know, working tools that you're going to use in your next projects? Do you even know, Derek? Well, definitely. I mean, I don't, you know, I have no idea well whether I'll do another film that's shot remotely or, or, or not. You know, that's, I think that's an open question. Um, Certainly, I learned. Uh, I guess one thing I learned about this about is is about how to be really super economical about mm -hmm. um, you know about what you see. I mean, it was interesting because you know normally if you're designing for film or television, you've got to design a 360 degree environment, or you have to have a, co a tough conversation with a director and the cinematographer where you say, you know, we can't afford to build this whole set. So we're just going to, you know, you're going to have to restrict your shots like this and you can't, right. you can't move around. The thing about this was that we had, you know, the cameras are fixed. Um, basically they were, uh, they were on people's tables on a, you know, on a tripod. And so um, it meant really yours for each of these actors, we were composing one shot, which was the shot for, for for the for, for the whole show and really you know with a few few very very brief exceptions that that was really it i mean sometimes they would walk away and and the autofocus on the on the camera would follow them as they would walk away you know into the background but um i mean that's sort of a it's it's sort of a unique and bizarre way to conceive of a, a film is where there's just you know we basically had five shots you know one for each actor and that was that's what made this story Mm -hmm. You know, Derek, I, I, it just occurred to me that since the actors were, I mean, you were working with the actors to sort of build the design of the show and the sets. Yeah. Does that normally happen? Like, I know we've worked together in the past. I don't remember ever walking up to you saying, well, you know, for for good for no, all, I, I, I really think it's important to have a cer really? certain kind of chair. Yeah. I mean, that, was that uh, new did, for you? I Nor did I make you build the set for good for all. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. You know, I, well, I'm still waiting to see whether Wally Sean will ever talk to me again after this. Uh, it was a lot of it was a lot of work for Wally. Um, oh my! Yeah, it was. Um, it, it was. Uh, you know, Wally had to not only be the actor uh, and the cinema, but you know, to, to be his own ca camera operator and his own lighting grip. But he also had to be his own co uh, construction coordinator, and um, you know, literally, we sent him these kits of parts. Like there was, you know, there were flats. And there were little feet, and um, he had to um, he had to install the feet to hold the flats up and set something. Set, set, so oh man, it was really uh, quite an extraordinary, quite an extraordinary thing that that he did it. But every actor had to do uh, some of that on this. You know, act, the actors had to learn to change their own uh, camera batteries and microphone batteries, and uh, you know, memory cards. Memory oh, cards. Man. I mean, it was really Very unbelievable cool. the stuff that that had to happen um it was it was quite incredible well may i just say from an actor point of view to be doing that for an actual finished production that's groovy it's when you have to do those kind of setups for an audition that i felt like i wanted to shoot myself in the head it's like i'm, sure. I'm not a lighting designer i how, how, do i coach myself after the first reading you know so at least everyone was doing it for a purpose and that that's really cool Queen, what about you? How will you approach costumes after doing this project? Yeah, I will definitely say, I mean, I, um, 
I definitely learned a lot, you know. Um, but I think part of it was also just, um, you know, always, um, you know, really trusting your intuition, um, and also, um, you know, really communicating a, a lot, like communicating more than you think you need to, right? Um, even down to socks, even down to like the little um, details um, about, you know, which arm should you put your watch on? You know, those are things because, you know, in the camera, you know, things might um, be, you know further in the back, things might be coming forward more. Oh, so, of course. Um, and I say the thing that I also that I also learned is that um, ultimately you have to keep going. You know, this entire time, I mean, to me, it all it, like it almost feels like a heartbeat. And the moment that you stop uh, creating, the moment that you stop thinking, the moment that you stop living in a way, it all stops. Mm. You know, it becomes um, stagnant. And so to me, I think this production really um, showed us in the world that, no, I mean, we have work to do um, and that we have stories to tell. And so this was really important. Um, so I definitely continue to take that with me. Yeah. Oh, that's so that's really cool. It, it Again, it's funny that in, in this production, the waiting, while it, it felt like waiting, there was also an active aspect to it. It wasn't it wasn't passive waiting. It was very active. Scott, this is a question for you. I guess this might be a good way to sort of wrap things up. Someone sent in uh, the question, do you sense that other theater companies have been watching this production as a test case for this new hybrid art form? And do you think this type of production is a precursor of things to come in the sort of new normal post-COVID world? What are you thinking? Uh, well, I don't know about other theater companies or what they're thinking. Uh, I think everybody's thinking about different things. And now a lot of people are thinking about how to reopen. Right. But um, yeah, I mean, we started the new group off stage as an experiment to see if we could keep it, keep people engaged. I mean, because, you know, you, you have to be in New York City and you have to be able to pay for tickets to shows. And, uh, and I thought maybe it would be maybe it would be interesting and, and make just the idea of theater more accessible if we took, you know, projects with theater in them and made films of them, you know, that, that, you know, that people could actually, so it's not the same thing as like a stage, like you yeah, you say, like a filming a play or a, uh, you know, like that sort of thing. It's, it's more created for this sort of, you know, mixed media, sort of idea. And the hope is that, you know, if, if we keep going and we have several projects that we're, we're doing um, and that maybe people will be introduced to the theater, you know, right. and, and when they come to New York or, or they'll visit their local theaters, uh, it just, I think it just gives people, it just makes it all more accessible. And, and in a way before COVID, that was something that I, I always, was trying to do just in live audiences, but the reach of something like this is so different that um, it feels like we're accomplishing making, you know, experimental and unique work that isn't necessarily, you know, for the commercial world. Um, and we're making that work and, and letting people see it. And you are. And it's one of the things that I love the most about New Group, not only the kind of productions that you do and your projects that you pick, but the, the constant um, goal to try to connect with people about things that are going on in the world. It's great. You, you were doing it when plays were happening and you're doing it again with this. And I want to just um, thank tonight's panel, Kramer Morgenthau, who wasn't able to be here, but sent in a very sweet little film, Derek McLean, the production designer, Queen Jean, costume designer, Jonathan Weinstein, editor, Weinstein, editor, and Scott Elliott, the director. And I just want to invite everyone, let's see where that page is, to, oh, for the next Offstage Talks event. Uh, that's going to be Wednesday, June 9th at 7 p.m. The new group in partnership with Broadway Wine Club is hosting Waiting for Godot with Wine, a digital event celebrating the release of two unique wines custom labeled for the new group. Whoa, the new grape and Waiting for Pinot. Okay, that's pretty good. Um, and that event's <laughs> gonna include John Leguizamo, uh, Broadway actress and sommelier Kate Rockwell, and Broadway Wine Club founder Arvind Ethan David, and a live 
wine tasting. That sounds pretty boss. For more information, to purchase the wines, you can visit thenewgroup.org. And I just want to thank tonight's panelists. This was wonderful. And I urge everyone to check out Waiting for Godot. It's streaming for a limited time at thenewgroup.org. Thank you for creating this beautiful art in a time that's been really tough. Um, thank you all. And uh, sayonara. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you.